Like behind schedule. Uh, so let's start with Andre Stals uh, from Brazil about iterables and observables, followed by a talk uh, and a demonstration by Lee about machine learning. A uh, short break, and then we split up to the pub quiz, this area, and uh, machine learning in uh, area two. So, uh, Andre. Where's Andre? There he is. Okay, uh, applause for Andre, please. Okay, two microphones. Yes. Because <laughs> I have two mouths. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is going to be a little bit of a challenge because I'm going to live code. <laughs> and as you can see, I am holding a microphone. Now, for a long while, I don't need to code, so I can just use one hand. But at some point, I'm going to have to code, and I have no idea how I'm going to do that. Let's find out together. <laughs> okay, so iterables and observables, and when to use them and why. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so raise your hand if you've ever used an iterable and you were like, you knew you were using an iterable. Okay, that's nice. That's very nice. Uh, async iterables. Okay, that's cool. Um, observables, ever use that? Okay, so I'm kind of preaching to the, to the normal audience here, but um, I hope that this shows a very different uh, way of why to use them. And I hope this is not like repetition of all, all the stuff that you already know. So um, these things are abstractions. And abstractions sometimes have a bad reputation in the sense that people say that abstractions are bad. And that's, that's not actually true. Some abstractions can be bad, but abstractions itself, you know, they are not bad. So one of the examples is functions. That's an abstraction, and you need functions, right? You can't just write code without functions, right? If you only have strings and numbers and objects, then you can't get a lot of things done. You need a function at some point. So uh, I'm going to sort of place that there as here's another level of, of programming. You can program just with concrete JS values, which would be kind of like assembly programming. But you can program with functions, which gives you superpowers. And that's like how we, we program normally. So my, my goal here will be just to show you that iterables and observables are actually just normal stuff. They are not like weird inventions that you should use or something like that. But they're actually uh, special cases of the function. So one of the special cases of a function is a getter. A getter is every function that takes no arguments and it returns something. Okay. Uh, who's going to give an example of that? What's a function that takes no arguments and returns something? Time, date.now? Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, math random. But so many others. And you, you definitely use this on, on, in, in your code base. You definitely have many getters. Uh, for instance, at least you have a getter of a promise. <coughs> like, that's a normal thing, right? Because you can't reuse promises. So that's where you use getters. And you can actually pass around these getters and sort of treat them as first level values. OK? So if you. <laughs> Take an like, even more special case of a getter. And that would be a getter getter. And it, it returns to you a getter. Okay, I know it's a bit sort of higher order. But the idea is that you, you call this function that has no arguments. And it returns to you a getter. Now, you probably don't have this in your code base. But the idea is that it's still just a special case of a getter, which is a special case of a function. So it's still just like a function. If you add something on top of it, which is uh, completion, OK? I don't need to explain that, because tomorrow I'm going to give this uh, workshop to uh, CodeZilla, and then I'm going to go into the details of everything of this. But the point is that if you add one special idea on top of getter getters, you get iterables. And that means that they're just a special case of functions. And as well, if you add asynchronicity, on top of iterables, you get 
special case of a function, but it's a very, very specific type of function, but it's very useful. So that's like one part of this picture, but this is also this other side, which is uh, the setters. Now a setter is a special case of a function which um, takes an argument and returns to you nothing. Okay, what would be an example of that? <laughs> Come on, you use this every day. Console log, right? It returns nothing, right? It takes an argument and returns nothing. But it's a setter, and you, you're basically setting something. Um, and now the reason why I stroke this out is that setters are actually not abstractions. It's a bit disappointing, um, but it means that they're like, you can create wrappers from setters, but they're not an abstraction because you can't like represent a value with a setter. Anyway, but if you add another layer on top of that, if you make a setter setter, that is an abstraction and you can work with this and it's very useful. And now I know this sounds confusing and that's the whole point of this talk, to confuse you. <laughs> so that I can later unconfuse you and you can get this feeling that you learned something, okay? But the idea with this is that every time you had add event listener, that's a setter setter. Okay? Has anyone used add event listener or set listener? Yeah, of course, right? So that's a setter setter. And those are very useful and they give you asynchronous programming. It will get more clear, I promise. <laughs> I can see. So the, the interesting thing is that you add a little interesting property on setter setters. In other words, you add an interesting property on add event listener and you get absorbables. So that's the idea. So they are simply special cases of functions, okay? You can write spaghetti code with functions and we can then get everything done or you can give more structure to your code and make things more sort of uniform and then you can use iterables and absorbables. So that's just the theory and I promise you this is where the theory ends. I'm gonna show uh, the code and where, where do you actually use this stuff? So I found this um, piece of code from the internet and I, I needed to find some, some bad code. Now that was challenging because, like to be honest, you, you, you can find bad code on the internet, but if you want to find bad code, it's not easy. So I tried to search the web for bad asynchronous JavaScript. You don't get anything useful. I tried to search Stack Overflow, but you only get small snippets. Then I searched uh, on GitHub for a long time, and then I found someone's hobby project. I hope it's not yours. Um, <laughs> and it was pretty bad, and I was like, this is nice. I can use this <laughs> for, for my demo purposes. So the point is that there's a lot of stuff going on here, but I noticed that there's a lot of um, add event listener, add event listener, there's re remove event listener, add event listener, add event listener. So this to me hinted a lot of things and you don't need to understand this. I don't even understand it fully, but there are some patterns here. So um, we know that, you know, here we're adding an event listener for key down and if the event, uh, whoa, I, I noticed that this should be here. I don't know, maybe the code is broken anyway. <laughs> Seriously, I don't think this even runs, but it was supposed to be there. Maybe I removed it, I don't know. Um, so anyway, once you get the event, you check, is the key code 13? If it is, then you run this snippet of code, and as you see, this is the whole if, so it doesn't have an else, okay? And this pattern repeats also here, there's a key down, if the event is key code 13, then you do this. So as you see, there's some repetition here, and this repetition is okay. I mean, as long as it's just two, but if you have more, it's bad. And also one of the bad things is that this is not really semantic, right? It's just a magical key, uh, magical number there tossed in, and it doesn't really tell you that this is actually listening for enter presses. Um, it's just like very sort of hard-coded, right? So we can do better than this by sort of, um, sort of is extracting this if, okay? So let me, let me do that 
with one hand. <laughs> um, has anyone volunteered to hold the microphone for me? Uh, okay, cool. But you might want, okay, if this works. So, <laughs> okay, so I'm going to make a function called add enter press listener. Okay, and it takes an element and it takes the listener. Okay, so then I just need to do element add event listener for key down, and then I can just do um, event, and I can check if event dot which is 13, then we call listener event. Is this fine by everybody? Right? It looks easy. So, of course, I could use this. Thank you. What's your name? Giovanni. Thank you, Giovanni. Um, so instead of this, I could use uh, add enter press listener item and then event. Actually, this would be async. And then I can remove uh, this if. Okay, thank you. So right, I got a little bit of advantage here because now, now I can literally just do add of enter press listener, right, instead of this generic add event listener if something. So I basically embedded that if condition into my function there. It's embedded there. Um, and this is nice, you can do this, but we're going to take this one step further, okay? Um, I'm going to make actually, uh, first I'm going to make add event listener and then, uh, you know, the, the nice thing in JavaScript is that functions are values, okay? So you could get a function such as add something listener and create another function and those two are like values, okay? That is basically working in the abstraction. Thank you, Giovanni. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, first, I'm going to make this thing called. Um, so th the annoying thing about add event listener is that it actually takes three arguments, element, the string, and the listener. So I'm going to just change that so it's a bit simpler. I'm going to make this thing called make add event listener that takes only one thing, which is the callback. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, Sorry, it's, um, well, no, okay. Make add event listener, and it takes uh, the el element, yeah, sorry, no, actually, no, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. It's gonna become clear when I, once I do this. So I just want to sort of have one uh, thing. So I'm gonna return a function, which is add key down listener, see? So I'm making that function. And this all only takes one argument. That's, that's what I want, just one argument. Not a string and an element, but just one argument. So this should be easy. I get the element, add event listener for key down and CB. So all that I did here was convert from sort of three arguments to just one argument. So uh, then I can do, thank you. Then I can do something here called uh, add uh, key down listener, which will be make add key down listener on the element which is called item. Okay, so now I could use this add key down listener and use the if condition, but instead of that, I'm going to create the thing called add enter press listener, which is uh, uh, the filtering of add key down listener. And here, this, thank you, Giovanni. So this filter will work just like array filter, okay? So you, who've used array filter? You've used array filter. I'm just making you lift your hand so you can acknowledge that you know what filter is. So what filter does is that it gets this thing and it creates <laughs> this new thing where this new thing is based on the first thing except it removes some stuff or takes some special case of, of some stuff. And that's what we want here because out of all of the key downs that can happen, I want to take only some special key downs, which are those that are on enter, right? 
So if you imagine that, just imagine that this is an array, okay? Then you know how to do this, right? How do you pick uh, only the events that are on enter given an array of events, right? You just do filter and then you say, um, oops, where is it? Whoops, I need your help. I can't do this with one hand. Um, event, event dot which equals 13. Okay, so once I have this, I can call it. So I don't need to any more uh, hard code that, but I do need to write a filter function. And it, it, it's not that hard actually. You just need the condition function, which is this event thing. And then you return, uh, no, you actually, you take the uh, add x listener, which is this one, and you return uh, add y listener where uh, the y will do something like it will listen for x and if this condition passes on x we're going to call cbx. Okay, you don't need to understand how does this work but you just need to know that it will work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you can take some time and, and actually look at that. But what, ma what really matters in this talk is that you understand what did we actually do here? I, I made an add key down listener, and then I filtered it. Because these are values, right? Functions are values, right? So then all that you need to do is just use this thing, add enter press listener, right? So, but what I essentially did here was I converted uh, from an if to a filter. And that's the key insight. Is that there's so many cases where you have if in your code base that you can actually have filter instead. That's, that's my lesson here. And what does that gain you is that you don't need to um, do if um, on yourself, but it can come basically pre-ifed already, sort of like if can be sort of inside that thing already, and you don't need to always use if yourself, you know? And there's so many cases where you could use that. And as you see, filter is not just for arrays, it's also for add something listener, right? And we could keep on doing this for so many other cases here. There's so many of these, such as uh, this one here, uh, we have a double click on a card and we want to check if that event is actually on div or p. You could actually make another thing called double click, uh, add double click on div or p listener. And that would just be, you know, this double click thing filtered for this condition. So slowly you can sort of remove these if conditions out from this uh, hard-coded situation here and you can take it out and then you could even expose it as libraries or something. So the, the logical conclusion if you just keep on doing this exercise is that you end up using a lot of these so-called operators that are functions that work on, on these <coughs> event streams essentially. So here I have a code base that actually does some real stuff it does some uh, auto search fields. So here I have a similar situation. I have key downs that are filtered for the enter key code and I also have tabs. And then you can do very magical things such as uh, enter press. Uh, you can combine that with other things such as every time I press enter or, because merging is kind of like an or, or, or I press tab or I, I'm actually de blurring out, but to an item, then I'm going to do this thing. So you can do all sorts of complex, um, not, not complex, okay, think um, sort of like all of this complex logic that you would have hard-coded can now be like done uh, in much less lines of code and very clearly because you can see that I want to keep focus on input whenever one of these happens. So this is actually what you get when, when you start using uh, that approach more. This is actually uh, uh, a library called Extreme, which is very similar to R RxJS. But the point is that 
This is actually very similar to this uh, trick that we did over here of writing filters and ad, event, um, ad, ad listeners, right? So I, I, I demoed to you setter setters, but observables are just like a little bit above that. And as you can see, it's not that heavy abstraction, right? I made this small thing here. So in, 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 a, in a short uh, sentence, when do you use observables? Whenever you have any kind of ad event listener, and you have if conditions inside it, and you have many of these ad event listeners, you're probably hard coding stuff in a very manual way that you can have done much more fluently and more easily with all of these fancy operators. That's essentially why and, and when to use observables. Now let me get to, uh, um, you can sit down for a while, thank you. Um, let me get to a, an interesting example of iterables. So iterables are essentially, uh, over here, they are essentially um, imaginary arrays. Okay, that's the best way of understanding iterables. Now, of course, you use arrays, right? Does anyone have an array that's very big, like in your code base, like more than a, a thousand or ten thousand? Yeah, you're probably doing the wrong thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, this is not disrespectful. I'm just saying that imaginary arrays, such as iterables, are the use case for that. And now, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you understand what I mean with imaginary array because, you know, it's like imaginary friends. I don't know if you've ever had those. I did. But they, they are not real. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they are imaginary. So, um, but you can make them become real. I, I'm just confusing you. I'm better just show you code instead. So. Uh, here I have a, a very good use case for these imaginary arrays. I have a very large graph, and I could just download that whole graph, and it would be like an array of edges, okay? I could do that. But that graph has 100,000 edges, and it's okay to have an array of 100,000 uh, entries in JavaScript, but the problem is that I'm rendering them in the, in the DOM, and that's going to look very bad. So let me see if I can get... Yeah, so here's my graph, um, and it keeps on loading stuff. Uh, I'm loading them one at a time, but like the naive way would be download this whole thing and display it all at once. Now, that's a bad idea because it would take a lot of time, at least in terms of user seconds. They don't want to wait that, lot, that much to, to load this whole graph. So what I did instead is I'm loading uh, each of these dots one at a time. So that's basically my imaginary array. I'm basically like picking one element at a time, and that's actually coming from the network. Um, this is just like a contrived example. Of course, you're not going to do this, but you see, every time a new dot comes in, I'm doing a new network request. So it's it's a it's a bad idea to just do ten a hundred thousand network requests and get all of these you know at once. That's a bad idea. So that's a use case for iterables. And in this code base, I kind of show, uh, so I, I have, a, this is the code for my server. It's very simple in the sense that I just ask for like next node, and it just gives me the next node, or next edge, and it just gives me the next edge, okay? Um, but the nice thing is actually the front end. So here's uh, my HTML file. And it only imports uh, some graph um, libraries. There's, nothing, there's only like rendering libraries here. There's no other kind of libraries. But this is my, my main code, OK? Um, what it does is that there's a bunch of pieces of the graph. And I go through each of the pieces. And I just add them. And I lay out them. L layout just means that, you know, distribute this nicely so they're not like in the same x0, y0, you know, just distribute them nicely. But you can see there's four, a wait, a wait, a wait, and a sync function. Uh, what's going on here? Um, so as I said, um, so parts is actually an async iterable. 
But what you can understand is that this is a, an, an imaginary array, okay? And I'm doing a for loop on this imaginary array, right? But it just takes, it takes some while for the next part to come, see? So if, if I want to say, please give me the next item in this array, it's going to tell me, sure, wait a minute, and I'll give it to you later. So this is what for await does. As, as you're used to async await, of course, it's just waiting for the next uh, promise, uh, for the promise to finish. Um, so this is nice because it, in my imaginary array, it's going to give back to me uh, one part of the graph. And as you can see, I did this thing here, batch. Um, batch is a really nice function that I wrote in just a few minutes or a few seconds. And you don't need to look at that. You just need to know that what it does is that, imagine that um, in this imaginary array of mine, um, let's say that it has 100 items, okay? If I say batch two, then my imaginary array has now 50 items. Because I'm saying get two of those at the same time, okay? So I can, I can change this and you can see how it's gonna react. Let me just actually open the real project. Um, let's put it like, uh, let's put 50 and let's see how it reacts. Uh, I think it's, yes, it's, fetching 50 at a time. So it's taking some while. Let's put it 20. Let's try that. Yeah, it's fetching 20 at a time. See? But uh, with this very simple operation uh, batch, um, it's, actually, it's actually not, it, it's, it's like processing things while they come, okay? Because this is my imaginary array, I created another imaginary array that has all those things grouped as, as one. I, I made another operator also um, that will take an imaginary array and it will return to me an imaginary array. So that's called take. And it limits the amount of, of it sort of uh, cuts the imaginary array, okay? So as soon as, um, I'm, I'm gonna start pulling one at a time, and as soon as I reach 50, I'm gonna stop. That's the idea of take, okay? But what it's not doing is that, it, it's not downloading a thousand and then cutting 50 of those, you see? It's, it's cutting it as soon as it, as it arrives. So it should stop at when it's 50 of them. And it's going to think that this is the whole thing. Um, kind of soon. Yeah, there we go. So it thinks that this array has done. But in reality, I didn't have the whole array and then cutting it, you see? Because you can do uh, these operations really nicely. So what that means is that uh, you don't need to go from imaginary array to concrete array change it, and then do the stuff. But you can go to, from imaginary array to imaginary array, and then take your, your things that you want. So you see, I'm doing a series of operations here, which is uh, take this imaginary array, create another imaginary array, and create yet another one with batch, and now I'm finally ready to use this, and then I'm gonna use it. Because it's, it's not a good idea to download all these unnecessary stuff and then operate on them. So, and the, the nice thing about the weight here is that I'm actually respecting uh, the resources as well. So one of the things I could do, which is a bad idea, is um, every time I get some, some data from the server, you see, I'm just gonna add it to my array, to, to my graph, and then I'm gonna lay it, do some layout. Now this layout will take some CPU, okay? because it needs to move the, the nodes around and it needs to sort of spread them nicely. But I'm not giving it enough time. I'm just saying do it and then go right to the next one. So at some point my CPU will start dying here because it's doing a lot of work. So I'm gonna run this and you're gonna see how, how bad it will become. 
It's just downloading a bunch of stuff. And I, I'm sorry, I should do a network, I should do a performance test, not a network test. Uh, like this. So for now, this is like quite fast FPS. And it's, it's working fine. But at some point, um, all of those uh, CPU tasks, they won't have enough time to stop their work. So they're just going to be like receiving a lot of data, but they're not going to be, they're not going to have peace to calculate the stuff. So at some point, this will stop being so interactive. It already dropped to 18 frames per second, and it will keep on dropping. At some point, it will go down to three frames per second, and it will just get worse. And this is the kind of stuff that, um, that sort of asynchronous iterables and async await can, can al allow you to do very easily is to fix this kind of bug in, in a very simple way, just by letting the CPU have some rest time. I think that was bad enough. Is it still loading? Yeah, it's still loading. So now it's down to 8 FPS. Let's take a look how this looks like. Yeah, it's probably taking so much CPU that even this is having some, a hard time. But it will show, I guess. Yep, it did. So you see all of these red things, they mean very low FPS. And as you can see, uh, my CPU was able to still manage at, in the beginning. But at some point, there's so much new data coming in that I still need to process this and it's not having enough peace, so it just gets overloaded. So by just allowing um, this CPU task to wait, then you're basically saying, wait for this uh, graph algorithm to finish, and then pull in the next network request from the server and, and do the processing. And with that, I think you run this benchmark again. It does get uh, busy, but it still doesn't, like, let's say, it doesn't die, you know, it, it doesn't, like, run out of resources. So the, the frames per second will stay something around 30 or 20, and it's not going to get those red dots everywhere. And all of this is just by saying, you know, uh, take a little bit of this imaginary array, you know, uh, on, 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 on a decent pace that sort of respects the, the CPU resources. Um, I actually don't know how, how long this should be, but it's still 40 frames per second, and uh, it's already 43 seconds, so that's like a long enough time. Something like 40, 30 frames per second. Let's stop it now and see. Well, let's really try to stress it. Yeah. So one of the interesting things is that now it's 15 frames per second, because, yeah, because um, it, I'm actually not interacting with the browser. So it's pulling stuff from the network as fast as possible. But as soon as I start interacting, the frames per second go up a bit because now more CPU is being used and it's sort of giving priority to that. So what this means is that you're, you're not going to like, you're going to be able to handle a lot of data and still not let the, the user experience crash and the frames per second go down, the kind of stuff. Let's see how this one looks. Dun, dun, dun. It's doing something. Quite sure it's not going to have, yeah, it, it has some reds here and there, but not as the previous one that was full of red stuff. And as you can see, the, the CPU is never at exactly at 100% because it's respecting all of those limits. So when do you use an iter iterable or an async iterable? Whenever you have a large array that is too large, uh, you should instead make it an abstract array or imaginary array. And then you can process it just like you process map, uh, you use map and filter on arrays, right? You can use map and filter on imaginary arrays as well. And the effect is going to be the same, actually. 
And you can even write these small uh, operations, um, such as batch or take is not that complicated. And yeah, that's the use case. So you can also, you know, every time you have an if inside of for, that's use, the use case for a filter. You can actually literally convert all of the for loops that have ifs, you can convert them to imaginary arrays. And that's what I wanted to talk. Um, hopefully uh, this, this made some sense. And all, all that I wanted to show you is that uh, these things um, are sort of natural abstractions. And they are not uh, invented. They are actually discovered patterns. And they, they make sense whenever you have a lot of unstructured spaghetti function code. That's it. Okay. Hopefully that was good. Okay, thank you. Good stuff, man. Uh, so you guys have a fashion statement for tomorrow. Um, be a both applause for Lee both please. Um, yeah, I visit mostly the banks and insurance companies in the Netherlands, and then I talk about Google Cloud. I help these companies with building prototypes or give technical presentations. And my expertise is mostly in, in chatbots and I would say like machine learning APIs. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Machine learning. Who of you have worked with machine learning before? A few? And is that TensorFlow or is that something else? Dialogflow. Dialogflow, yeah, that's my favorite. Yes. So machine learning, I always explain it very, very simple. Like, how did you learn your first language? Eh? Like, how, like, I'm Dutch, how did you learn Dutch? I bet your parents did not hand you over a dictionary and told you, now you have to read it from A to Z. And on the last page, then you're at then you're a master in Dutch language, right? No, we, we learn from examples. As a kid, for example, they said like, well, that's a car, it has four wheels and it uh, drives on the road. That's a bike, it has two wheels and rides on the road. And if you saw a lot of bikes and lots of cars, at some point yeah, you would really understand like what the difference is between a car and a bike. And if you would say it wrong, you'd say to your parents like, hey, look, that's another car. And then your parents would probably correct you and say, like, well, actually, that's not a car. That, that's a truck because it's bigger or, or it has more wheels. See, so we also learn from, from corrections. And that is actually also how it works for, for a machine. Uh, like the data scientists, they create a model. And then they put lots and lots of data in these models. And at some point, the, the yeah, machine or the, yeah, the model will start recognizing patterns. And if the machine has it wrong, then we correct that model so that over time it becomes smarter. Yeah. So why is machine learning so popular right now? Why do you hear so many people talking about machine learning? Well, that is basically because we collected or we gathered so much data over time. Right? Like at Google, we, we used to say like, um, in the past when we would create apps, like, like 10 years ago, uh, then we would say to people like, well, our design idea of building apps is to make it for the smallest screen so then eventually it will run on every device. And we will, we will create like a mobile first approach. And that was for a very long time Google's design way of, of creating apps. And now since the last couple of years we said like well we got it so much data we will shift our approach of designing apps and we will create more an AI first approach for building apps because we can finally learn from our data. And that is why machine learning is so popular right now. Everybody has so much data. We can make our applications smarter. Uh, eventually, it also means like we have much smarter data scientists and we have lots of data centers <coughs> everywhere in the world, not only Google, also Amazon and Microsoft, uh, that uh, basically are like big racks of computers and they share computing power and they share uh, data storage. And that is all what you need for creating a uh, machine learning model. I mean, obviously, you can create a machine learning model on your own machine, but then you need to train the model. So you put all that data in that model, and it takes a lot, a long time to train it. If you have a cloud, or you have like 
lots of machines and you can just start and stop and you, you can very fastly train your, your models in the cloud. So let's, let's do some machine learning here. Huh? What is the difference between a cat and uh, or a dog and a mob? Now you probably will think, well, I don't need machine learning for that. That's easy or not. <laughs> <laughs> some are really tricky here that I really have to look. Huh? So let, let's use some machine learning here. Um, now typically with machine learning is you would, you would look at the picture and then such a machine learning model can give you uh, yeah, a confidence score back. That's what you see here also in the, in the uh, uh, diagram. Uh, you see like dog and then it says a percentage, 99% sure that this picture is it's a dog. But you see also that um, it's only 51% that, uh, that it thinks it's a dog cross tree. So that actually means if we would feed it more data, then finally we can get those numbers up. Um, and the way how that works is like, it basically, it, it works like, it's neural networks. It's just how it works in your brains. So we look at an, an image, and then you look at pixel level, and then we just look at a very small set of pixels, and then we think like, is this more, in this case, a cat, or is it a dog? And then if we know it for some, uh, some percentage, and then we start looking at more pixels, and more pixels, and more pixels, until it's all the whole image, and then we can say for sure, like actually, this is a dog. Now, machine learning is part of artificial intelligence or AI. It's a, it's a part of it. Um, artificial intelligence is actually that the process of, of making a computer or building a smarter computer. So that means like as developers, if else coding, for example. Um, and machine learning, that's the process of letting a computer learn. Now an observation is made that it's actually much yeah, better to let a, let a machine learn by, by its data. And you can think about that uh, as a developer because like when you create if else statements, there's always a reason how you can, or there's always some way how you can break your own code. And there's always like uh, another reason, you put more, more in and you have to mo modify your code. But with machine learning, yeah, you just pass in more data and eventually it becomes smarter over time. It learns from the, its data. So why do people think about Google when we talk about machine learning? Well, I think that is because TensorFlow is one of the most famous framework, machine learning frameworks. Uh, that's online, it's open source. Uh, you, can, you can run it on your laptop and start experimenting with it. Um, TensorFlow is a Python framework. Are there any Python uh, developers here in the room? Same group that did machine learning and a few here, yeah. I believe TensorFlow nowadays is also available in JavaScript. That, that is nice for if you want to do some machine learning with your sensor data in your, on your phone, maybe. But um, I think uh, machine learning with TensorFlow, that, that can be difficult. I don't know how, how about you guys, but for me, I think machine learning is, is hard. We'll talk about that later. But Google huh, is, is an AI company. We do everything with machine learning, everything. If you look at all our applications, there is somehow machine learning into it. We just don't call it machine learning anymore. But I think one of the first examples of machine learning in a Google product is, for example, the spam filter in Gmail. Yeah? Is it spam or not spam? If, it, uh, if the computer had it wrong, well, we would correct it, and then we'll, the computer would learn over time that it's not spam. YouTube. Yeah? like recommendations, like which, vi which video you would like based on all the other videos that it has seen. That's machine learning. The Waymo and the self-driving car, I believe today the uh, first version came out, I read. Um, that's all about machine learning. There's a car huh, with, uh, with sensors and a big uh, 360 camera on the roof that can look around and when it drives on the road, and for example, it sees in, in parallel an, a bike, yeah, then it knows like, well, the prediction is probably not, nothing wrong will happen here. But if you're on a crossroad and the kid is uh, standing across of you, yeah, then it's suddenly a lot difficult to predict, right? So that's all about machine learning, like making these predictions while, while driving around. Yeah. Here is another example of machine learning. Yeah? This is like the Translate app, and I believe it's now native in Android in the Google Lens, where you can just uh, hold your camera on some text in this case, I think it's Russian text. And um, it, yeah, it, it, it shows you live the translation. Let me click this pop-up away. Okay. 
the Google Home eh, or the Google Assistant is also a machine learning. And it's like basically the Google Home is just a device with a microphone and a speaker, and it's it's listening to yeah to what you say. But I mean then then I mean first of all like listening to what to what's being said. Eh, that's like machine learning. It probably what it does is it takes the text and it trans transcribes it to uh, or it takes the audio transcribes it to text. Mm -hmm. and then it goes to a server, and from the server it starts uh, yeah looking around for the answer and sends it back. Chatbots, all machine learning. Uh, I, I work a lot for the banks and insurance companies. Fraud, uh, fraud detection, for example, uh, that's also a very common uh, machine learning model. Now, the thing here is, is like there is a lack of machine learning expertise in our industry. And that is because machine learning is very hard. Now, if you s if you look on this screen, uh, you see like from the 21 million developers, there's only one or less than one million data scientists and uh, about thousands of deep, uh, deep learning researchers. So that really gives you already the impression you really need to understand data really well. When, when you would create a machine learning model with TensorFlow, <laughs> typically what you would do is you would pre-process your data, you would, take your da you, would ha you would take a data set, you would probably divide it in pieces, where you say like this is my test data set, this is my evaluation data set, and then you start creating a model in, in TensorFlow, where you need to understand the data and then write this model. And then you start tuning the parameters and you start training it. Training, again, costs also a lot of machine learning power. And then you probably will go over it and over it again. And that, that is hard. Um, so since I'm an engineer, I'm a JavaScript developer as well as you guys, or most of you, I think. I think uh, there are lots of other tricks that you can do uh, to also play around with machine learning, which is a lot easier. So the first example, that's all about the TensorFlow that I explained. But uh, the middle one here, that's the, those are the pre-trained models. And this is really nice, because a pre-trained model, that's actually just a REST API call that you make to one of Google's models. Google created models for you that are already trained. So you don't need to be a data scientist. You just call a URL, you send it some data, and it returns your results back. We have APIs in JavaScript, we have APIs in, in Java, in any language that you uh, can think of, where you just make a REST call. And you can start playing around with that. And the last example, uh, that's the dialog flow that I heard earlier today, like the, the conversational solutions, uh, if you want to create chatbots or uh, virtual assistants. Yeah, that, that's also machine learning. We also have tools for that. Now, the thing is, like training your own model, that makes a lot of sense if you want to create like a really specific machine learning model, like, like the fraud example eh, for, for a bank. Obviously, Google doesn't have a pre-trained model for that because we're not a bank. Uh, the pre-trained models, yeah, those are things like translation or, or, or speech or video. But that, that's always like very, very global, right? That's very generic. What you probably want to do is you want to create your own machine learning models. Or what I like to do is I want to create my own machine learning models, but I don't want to use TensorFlow. I want to do it the easy way. And that's AutoML. You take the best of both worlds. Now let me first dive into the pre-trained models, and then you will understand AutoML better. Pre-trained models, we have them in all kinds of flavors. We have um, pre-trained models for vision. Vision, that means like, We'll make an API call, we send it a photo, and the pre-trained model returns me results. What it tells me what it sees in the photo. It tells me OCR, OCR detection, so the text that it sees in the photo. Does it matter if the text is tilted or like fuzzy? The OCR detection will recognize that. And um, yeah, it tells, you, it tells you back. I think it also has like an inappropriate content filter. So imagine if you're creating like a a CMS system and you know, allow people to upload photos, then you want to make sure that nobody uploads porn, right? So that you can flag that. Um, we also have sentiment in photos. Um, for example, if, then if we don't recognize the persons on the photo, but we can see like if the person is happy or if he's wearing glasses or the position where the eyes are. So maybe you want to do some things with that. We have vi the video intelligence API that is kind of like the Vision API, but instead of uploading a photo, you upload a video, and then it returns you similar re results as for the Vision API, except that it also will understand the full video. 
So it knows it from the first frame till the end and then uh, get, gives you the context back. Imagine that you're, if you're a media company and you want to upload lots of videos on a, on a media website. Uh, this can be interesting because maybe you want to uh, index and start classifying your, your videos. We are, we are doing this, for example, for a big sports channel. We can search exactly like where, like if you upload a soccer video, and you can see like, oh, if you would search then on uh, the minute where a goal was made, yeah, because of the machine learning uh, uh, predictions, we, we, we know exactly on which goal what happened. So that, that is a nice example for, for video intelligence. The speech API, we, we nowadays have this in two different ones. We have a speech API that takes an audio file and transcribes it to text. So that makes sense for, for example, like, like now that I'm like talking to you guys, I could, if I would um, speak into the speech API, I could like create live, uh, live subtitles. But that's also what people are using it for, like for, for creating like, yeah, uh, subtitles or just writing out whole conversations, um, yeah. We also have the other way, the other way around. So that means like I type text and we have like a voice talking back. And these voices, they sound, these are the wave map models. Maybe you have seen the duplex video on, uh, on YouTube a while ago eh, where we had bots calling hairdressers. I don't know if you've all seen it. Yeah, yeah if, you don't have, if you haven't seen it, I'll show it to you later in the other room. But uh, yeah, that's uh, basically like you type text and uh, a robot talks it back or speaks it out for you. Natural language API, this is one of my favorite. This means we really start to understand text. So like, let's say I type something, then it recognizes the entities. It recognizes like if it's a person, if it's a car, if it's an object. Um, it also uh, recognizes the sentiment. So let's, for example, an, an application that I've built is like, I was like scraping all tweets fr from, from Twitter. And then I was like uh, detecting if people were angry or, or, or sad or happy, you know, based on, on text. So sentiment detection, that's also really, really nice. Like you can use this, for example, uh, doing social media scraping, like figuring out like what do people think of your brand. Now the translation API, you probably know this from Google Translate. This is similar, but then a model that you can call you pass it in, for example, English, and you say like whichever language you want it back in, and you get the text back. Uh, people use this in combination often with other APIs. Like, for example, if you have the speech API, eh, you transcribe your, your audio file to text, and then maybe you want to translate it also to a different language in real time. Right, so now that I showed you the, the pre-trained models, eh, these are the default models from Google, but you want to create your own model. But we don't want to learn TensorFlow. That's what I just said, right? Because I said like machine learning is hard. So this is where AutoML comes in. Uh, that means like, uh, like if you take like a generic machine learning model from Google, yeah, then for example, I would upload, if I would use AutoML for vision, I would upload the photo of a, of a cat. Then the Google pre-trained model will tell me like, well, this is a photo of a cat. But if you would create your own machine learning model with, for example, TensorFlow, I could say like, well, if I see this picture, it's not a cat, it's the cat named Bob. Like we can make it very specific. And obviously Google doesn't know that this cat's name is Bob. You need to really train your own data set to do that. What we can do is with AutoML, we'll make it like very easy. You can just upload your own data and you make sure that you label it. You can label it in, an, in a CSV file. And then you start the training out of the box, comes in a web interface, and it starts creating your own model. So what it does, it, it takes the pre-trained model of Google, and on top of it, we put your own data, your own labeled data, and start retraining it again. And then it becomes your own unique model, and you get, like again, like an, a URL back, and you can start calling the REST API. This is very easy. I will show you a demo. Uh, in a couple of seconds. And that means that it really makes it easy for you because you don't need to pre-process uh, pre your model or create your model in TensorFlow. It does this all out of the box. So let me, I'm sure my, my voice is loud enough to, to show this. Oh, I need to make sure that I use the right uh, laptop because I, I did this big trick where, because um, since my Mac didn't work on, the, on this screen, I 
I'm using a Hangout now, so uh, what you see is actually somebody else's computer. But um, yeah, so so what I did, I created uh, since I since I'm often at the bank, well, I uh, I created like this fake banking portal, and I created like um, like a search bar, and you can search through transactions. Now I'm going to use like natural language to search through my transactions instead of searching for a particular company name or uh, like a bank account number. I could use natural language here and I could say how much have I spent on taxis last month and I hit enter. Uh, let me hope it works. Yes, and you see now it starts filtering the list. Basically what I do is I, I'm, I'm using natural language, it figures out like what the answer is and based uh, on the answer, the answer is taxis, it starts filtering the list. But this means that my transaction data needs to be labeled. I need to have all my transaction data labeled as like TCA is a taxi, Uber is a taxi, a steakhouse is a restaurant. If I bought a video game, then it needs to be classified as shopping. So I need to create these labels. And now often uh, at the bank, probably banks have these data and they have these labels. But since I'm not a bank, I don't have a service that auto labels transactions. So I thought like this would be a great case to use AutoML for. I'm gonna use my own um, transactions labeler and I'll show you how I did that. I just created an Excel sheet, or in my case, an, a, a Google sheet. And um, here I just created like a couple of, of example sentences and I gave it a, a label name. So here in this case you see like uh, if, if it's rent payment then it needs to be classified as, as mortgage. Um, if I see something with light it needs to be classified as utilities. and uh, if I talk about uh, music, then it needs to be classified as shopping. The thing here is, is like um, I'm using here like a couple of, I think seven or eight uh, different categories. And I think the best uh, practice is to use at least 100 training phrases per category. Now I didn't do that because I was lazy. I just took uh, between 10 and 20 uh, training phrases. But no, if you want to create a really good model, probably create hundreds of training phrases with one label. I wanted to, um, yeah, once it's in a, it's a sheet, you can export it to a CSV file, and I, up, I go to AutoML interface in Google Cloud, I upload the CSV file, I could upload it directly or I could put it in, an, in a bucket, and then I uh, hit create data set and start training. Uh, typically to train this, this takes about, uh, I would say like a couple of hours. Now maybe you think like, well, that takes long, but that's actually very, very fast because like, the natural language model of Google, that, that, that is a, like a very uh, complex and heavy model, right? That would take maybe weeks to train that. But because it's part of a, a cloud solution, we can train it very fastly. We can take that Google Cloud model, put your own data set on top of it, and start training it in, in a couple of hours. That's what I did. And then you get here like the evaluation uh, screen, or evaluation screen. And um, as you can see, I uploaded, I think, like seven, seven labels here. And you can see I get a precision score of almost 70, yeah, 87%. That is like, a, like the, that's amazing, uh, the score. That's like really, really great score. Imagine, eh? like I only uploaded between 10 and 20 training phrases per label. And I already get like a score that is like close to 90. I think that's, that's really impressive, you know? And that is because like the pre-trade model, the natural language model of Google is already a very good model and it knows already, it understands already a lot of text. I just need to write like a few training phrases on top of it and then uh, it makes it unique. Now, if I scroll down, you can see that it, uh, yeah, created like a confusion matrix. Now, what does this confusion matrix tells me? It tells me like from all my labels, uh, there is probably some overlap between the labels restaurants and shopping. Yeah, and that made me think. And I thought like, yeah, that's probably correct. Because if I say like, I how much did I spend on pizzas? I could eat a pizza in a restaurant or I could buy a pizza at the grocery store, right? So I, that means like, 
if I want to correct this issue, I just need to upload more specific data that it, so that it can learn from it. Now finally we can start testing it out and, and play and see if it all worked out. So I'll start typing here something like um, is my energy bill already paid and I hit predict and there you go it's classifies as that utilities that's that, that worked out great. Now if I want to implement this in my website, now I just need to use this REST call and uh, run it into my applications and then I can start, start using it. And then, yeah, that, that's what exactly what I did here because I start yeah, putting all these labels and I start labeling it through the, through the interface. Now what I did not do, but what I definitely am gonna do in the next couple of weeks is like now that I have this auto ML training model, what I could do is I can for example make a picture of a receipt Let's say I uh, ride an Uber in the evening and I make a photo of the Uber receipt. I, I would use Vision API to take the text from, with OCR detection. I get that text and then I can use my own unique model and I could say like, oh, this is Uber. This, this is definitely an Uber receipt. <coughs> Let's classify it as taxi. So I think that's a really nice example. I think I have some time, so I can talk. Yeah. Do I have time or not? <laughs> I don't? No, yeah, in the, in, the, in, the in the other room. Okay, so for the people that want to learn more about chatbots, I will, I will talk more about chatbots in the, uh, in the other room. But I, I hope you get like a little of an impression of like being a JavaScript developer, <laughs> all, JavaScript developer also means like you can play around with machine learning and it's actually very easy. So, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, we're going to continue in the room across the toilets uh, with some more things about uh, the APIs and the bots and the things yep. you can do yourself. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this room, the front maniacs, Randy and Steven, uh, are going to present of the host uh, the pub quiz. So if you want well, to, tell me guys, what can you win? Google Home Mini. Google Home Mini. Stay here, we're going to make some things. Uh, well, they, they will explain to you how it works. I think uh, some of you guys have been here before. So all the things you've learned, now this is the test. <laughs> Yeah, no, we're going to 